Hello again, everybody. I'm Jamie. And I'm John. And this is the Elvis Archival Preservation Society. If you're a big Elvis fan like us, this is your society, our society, the EAP Society. If you're enjoying the EAP Society, be sure to like, share, comment on the video, subscribe to the channel if you've not already, because all of that helps us in the algorithm. Uh, when we hit 20,000 subscribers, we are going to get, we're going to give away this Elvis Presley personally owned item. We're going to do a drawing and somebody will win this for free when we hit 20,000 subscribers. And all of that helps us in the algorithm to reach more people and uh, be able to do more and uh, preserving Elvis history, making sure that Elvis history is not lost to history. If you want to get in on the ground floor of the EAP Society, become a member. Go to eapsociety.com, click on become a member in the paid tiers, get all of the cool perks that you see below. Uh, thank you so much to all of our members. You make so much of this possible. We really, we, we love you so much. And thank you very much to our very own Colonel, Colonel Miles Foreman. Thank you, Colonel. All right. We have been looking at a, a myriad of the Elvis specials, uh, by the Elvis monthly, um, club and, uh, by the, by the, yeah, yeah by Elvis Albert Mon Hand. Yeah. The British fan club, the published fan. Thank you. Uh, Elvis, uh, monthly and also publish these annual specials. Yes. And now this one is, Interesting, uh, in a sort of a unique way, because obviously we know 1977 was Elvis's final year. Right. Uh, now, what should be noted uh, is that this came out in June. Well, this was finished compiling in June of 1976. So the really interesting one will be 78, because that will be having this it would be the final compilation composition of one of these magazines from when elvis was actually still alive which is weird to think about yeah with it having a 1978 designation right so it's yeah i'm really interested to see like if they stopped the if they added like an insert if they stopped the presses what they did yeah you know but uh anyway so uh, I'm going to sneak in here. Well, I say sneak, but I'm just going to bound uh, annoyingly over to the thing here so I can show you all. <laughs> I, I do love the cover. This really reminds me of a lot of, it's a color version of a, a lot of like the 80s picture compositions that you'd see. Yeah, I, lo I love the uh, the composition. Mm -hmm. I love the way that they sort of blued the Aloha jumpsuit so you could see the figures in front better. Yeah. But it gives you a nice uh, mix of pictures from Elvis in the 1970s. You got two shots from the Aloha, one from That's the Way It Is, and yeah. one from 1972 on tour. Mm -hmm. And this... Uh, Another 72 picture that's been, uh, they've used this in yeah. uh, one of their inserts, one of their double, their uh, centerfold pinup, whatever. I think it was the 1975 one, in fact. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. So, uh, and again, quite a myriad of pictures, as always. And some nice illustrations as well. Yeah. You know what? There was a, I think those drawings were also used on, um, oh gosh, I've seen, I've seen those before on things in the eighties. Yeah. So definitely. Yeah. The Elvis Presley story. A look behind the scenes of his early life, movie career and modern day lifestyle written by the secretary of Elvis's British fan club, Todd Slaughter. So pretty interesting. So that way you can uh, have a gander at this for yourself. Great picture of the Silver Phoenix. Yeah. <laughs> a very interesting squatty uh, drawing of Elvis. I mean, it's a caricature. It's a caricature. Yeah. That was made to fit on that little section there. That's all right. Don't think twice. It's all right. Don't think twice. <laughs> hey, it is nice to see that, you know, as we move further into the 70s, they're using more and more modern pictures. Yep. In the 68 to 70 transition, they were a little slow to update to yeah. the new Elvis, you know? Yeah. Well, they didn't really, at you know, considering uh, considering what they had access to and how much slower things got over there mm -hmm. you know you didn't see as much it's funny elvis's son career and there's hoax Salad annie 
The guy who hands me my water and my scarves, General Flunky. <laughs> K Paul. <laughs> that's, that's that moment right there. All right. But they still have some rare shots. Yeah. From across Elvis's life, which is pretty cool. How many gold records has Elvis earned? Lots. <laughs> it's, a, it's a one word article. <laughs> That's interesting. Elvis, li El Elvis live at Vegas spells rapture, improves reason for living, stimulating the hearts he's captured, provoking hopes and tempting, teasing glance, rendered to all who seek perchance, enveloping the atmosphere he creates, superstar by natural fate, lovingly modest, dynamic energy appreciated. Yes. Oh, that's, that's great. It's fabulous. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Give me some weight pills on a diet sheet. You know, sorry, no. A couple of representatives of Elvis's British fan club presenting yeah. him with, with an award backstage in Las Vegas. And uh, this uh, was used in uh, th this. They cropped the picture over here. Yeah, they here. cropped uh, Tony Prince out there. Yeah, only Elvis and Todd Slaughter. Yeah. In the 75 issue. And now that's backstage at the Aloha. Is indeed. From a fair to a fan club. The Vintage Elvis Fan Club. That's cool. Elvis Disc Puzzle. Compiled by David Trotter. Interesting. Okay. All right. So pause that if you want to give that a try. Oh, for men only, the leading ladies crossword. Well, that's sexist. <laughs> you don't think the ladies follow the leading ladies too? Right. <laughs> I hate Vegas. I loathe Vegas. I despise Vegas. I want to go back to Vegas. <laughs> that's... That's fantastic. Elvis's secret syndrome. All right. His secret syndrome is that he was in love with Anne Margaret in Viva Las Vegas. <laughs> what makes Elvis great? Asks Rob Harding. And if you don't know, man, you're in the wrong place, boy. <laughs> Let's get this show on the road. Here's Elvis and Robert Wagner. Yeah. It's very, uh, very odd, um, the uh, exposure on that picture. Yeah. Everybody looks like they've been in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool, seeing around, uh, around Graceland. Yeah, and lots of these fans were going over to America and taking the Elvis tour. Right? Okay. There's always one page in the middle that's like, nah, I don't want to. Yeah, you will, by God. There we go. Cool. Always cool to see pictures of locations and stuff from the time, too. Even if like things like Graceland haven't changed too much. but Exactly. But still, there's just something unique about it. The history of the Elvis LP cover. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's good. Making sure, yep. There we go, Elvis Christmas album. Uh, for LP fans only, fitting. Oop, I just... I dinged our letter opener, sorry about, not dinged, but... Touched our letter opener with the book. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> I think it'll survive. I'm pretty sure it will. <laughs> no. It's almost as sturdy as Elvis's pool. <laughs> oh, sole goodness. possession for a uh, post sole possession of the king. Woo! Losing pages. Sorry, folks. Such a night. Thoughts from Pat Bars. Yeah, we've got accounts in this magazine. Uh, we'll read some of these, but uh, 
One is from September of 73. A fan attended a Vegas show and wrote it up. And one is from August of 74. So That's cool. Yeah, I guess well, this was June of 76. So yeah. they'd collected some from the past few years. Yep. Vintage Thoughts by Paul Jackson. I remember. By Ray Noakes. Nineteen fifty six by Tony Neal. Big year for Elvis. Indeed. And using a fifty seven picture. Cause it had been almost twenty years, so I guess they figured you're close enough. Close enough. I mean, that's a cool shot. Technically, he got that uh, that big J two hundred in the latter part of fifty six, right? October, or somewhere around there. So. Unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory accumulation, <laughs> and never been to Spain, but I sure wouldn't like wouldn't like to go there. Okay. Uh, this is probably more complaining that he hadn't toured internationally. I'm sure. Which, hey, I get. I get yeah. it. My Las Vegas. Boom, 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 boom. And a cool Stay Away Joe shot there. And a hoop and a holler and I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> An Elvis experience. John Barlow. That's a cool picture. All right, tell you what, we're going to stop there for just a moment. We're going to be back with the Elvis special 1977 when we come back from these messages. Don't go away. All right, we are back looking at the Elvis special 1977, and we're going to dive right back in with this neat picture of Elvis in the alpine suit. And again, Pretty impressive uh, to see the picture, the way the pictures are reproduced in this book, in all of these books. They are, they do a, an excellent job. Yeah. Stateside positions reached by Elvis's albums nationally. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I think by this point you were starting to see more international uh Orders of this magazine or this book, probably books. so. Yeah. Well, worldwide publications, right? So, silver discs. Here's the complete list of silver discs awarded to Elvis. Hey, two hundred fifty thousand. My boy's on there. It is indeed. Much to the chagrin of some folks at uh, certain <laughs> message board. <laughs> Songwriters by Peter Jones. That's cool. That's an interesting uh, caricature there. It is indeed. Busty lady serving Elvis a birthday cake. <laughs> yep. Uh, the architectural history behind Graceland. I wonder if they'll talk about the uh, other house that was built just like it. I was thinking about the, uh, that the other day. I was going to try and see where that was because we went there. Uh, yeah. I, I got to see it. and I'm, It's I'm, in uh, northern Mississippi. Yeah. I know kind of where it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I've been blanking on uh, where Elvis's, Elvis's RCA, RCA catalog. catalog. It is indeed. There we go. They've got a legendary performer volume t two. Excuse me. <laughs> Sporting by Peter Jones. Hey, man, that family has two Elvises in it. <laughs> That's a very rich family. <laughs> and the answers. All right. Elvis's secret syndrome. I, I don't get why they called it. I, uh, I think they were looking for words and they just decided to throw that on there. There we go. Hey, one of the answers on that puzzle was get low. Really? Elvis's dog, yeah. I'll be damned to give low didn't show up any. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So very, very cool. All right. So uh what's the first what's the first one you want to look through there? All right, let's see here. I wanna read because I you know, I am very amused by this show. Yeah. I wanna read the account of the September the third, seventy three 
closing show in Vegas. All, All right. right. This is called The World's Greatest Showman by Ann E. Nixon. <laughs> I have seen many live Elvis performances and several Elvis moods. Sometimes he's serious and singing hard and strong. Sometimes he has the sillies, as Tom Diskin calls them, and breaks up laughing throughout the show. Sometimes he's in an infectiously happy mood, and sometimes he's a little uptight. Elvis never attempts to cover up his moods, and the audience invariably gets caught up in whatever mood he's in. <laughs> There is one particular show that stands out in my memory that combined with many of El that combined many of Elvis's moods an absolutely riveting show that anyone who saw it would never forget from the beginning to the end it underlined the supreme showmanship that is Elvis Presley let's relive this superb performance Elvis's closing show in Las Vegas on the 3rd of September 1973 <laughs> first of all though a flashback to the 3 a.m. show on Sunday, the 2nd of September, when Elvis startled us by coming on stage riding on Lamar Fike's back. And then, when he'd stopped laughing, asked, How can you top that entrance, man? <laughs> the closing show crowd was excited and waited impatiently through 2001, anticipating Elvis's entrance. He surprised us all again. Out came Lamar Fike, a mountain of a man carrying the king on his back. But on Elvis's back was a monkey. <laughs> the brown and white stuffed toy was taped to Elvis's shoulders, its arms around his neck. To the astonished, the astonished audience watched as Lamar carried on r right across the stage, then came back center stage and set Elvis down. Elvis was laughing as he took his guitar from Charlie Hodge, but couldn't manage the guitar very well with the monkey on his back. <laughs> He began C.C. Ryder with a few lyric changes uh, with a reference to the monkey and then threw in a hang on, kid, at one point. The audience was in disarray, laughing at Elvis's facial expressions. He said before singing, I got a woman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I brought one of my relatives with me. <laughs> More <laughs> lyric changes in Elvis's second number. I got a monkey way across town. <laughs> And so on. Someone yelled out, Give him a kiss, Elvis! As Elvis was sinking down to JD's low bass note on Amen. Looking back at the monkey, Elvis thrust the microphone near its mouth and said, He's an ape. That ain't no monkey. <laughs> he began, Love me, but didn't move along the front row as usual to accept kisses and give out scarves. He stood center stage, and although he, he laughed a little during much of the song, he sang quite seriously, almost making us believe he'd forgotten the monkey. At the end of the song, Charlie unstuck the toy for him, and it set on stage for the rest of the show. Elvis did a fine version of Steamroller Blues, followed by a strong Lord You Gave Me a Mountain. The show's mood had changed as Elvis's mood became serious. Trouble followed, and Elvis pounded out his rock medley of flip, flop, and fly, etc. At the close of Hound Dog, he began with a ch 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 kind of sound. It went on, and he continued to improvise. The band picked up behind him and jammed along. Elvis was bent, uh, bent over double, knees bent, and moving from side to side, real gone. The audience was half hypnotized, half screaming. The crowd of Scottish fans at my table were all screaming. It was a tremendous atmosphere. We applauded, feeling wrung out. Elvis, I want your scarf, called a feller down front. Okay, you can have it. Here you are. <laughs> and the king passed down his flame-red scarf to the upstretched hands. The fans nearby crowded in on Elvis and handed him up a summer festival boater. He wore it for a moment and then did a soft shoe shuffle. He walked back center stage. His serious mood became a silly's mood. As uh, on the way, he kicked over a music stand near Charlie. I'd like to sing a little bit of Love Me Tender for you. Love me tender, love me true. He squeaked in a high voice very rapidly. Yeah. Oh, that's the little bit of Love Me Tender. Speed it up. He turned to Charlie and urged quietly, put a scarf on, do it. At the introduction, as the introduction began, Elvis fell flat onto the stage and began to sing. And Charlie walked over to him, draped in white sc scarves, uh, white scarves draped over his face. He ad-libbed a verse, Adios, madre, bye-bye, papa, too. To hell with the Hilton Hotel. 
<laughs> the many British fans present cheered, and the last line was lost on the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Due to the cheers, Priscilla too. Yeah. More ad libbing came in the same song. I will help you all I can because I know you're blind. <laughs> Elvis was back on his feet as we applauded. His jibe at the Hilton was unexpected, but welcome to the British fans whose reservations the hotel had tried to cancel that season, and we felt that he was on our side. A ripple of excitement ran through the audience as fever began. Elvis stood out on the ramp, the spotlight picking out his mostly multicolored stones on his white jumpsuit. His silly mood continued as he ad-libbed a verse about J.D. Sumner and Myrna Smith of the Sweet Inspirations. After that line, I had a very mad affair. Yeah, yeah. I light up. Uh, I light up when you call my name. He mimicked the fans by shouting Elvis in a high voice. He continued to ad lib until the end of the song, throwing in lines like "I'm allergic to cats" and "Fahrenheit or Siamese," <laughs> and telling his shaking legs to cool it, you fools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite the best crazy version of Fever I ever heard him do. We're gonna be back with the Elvis special 1977 when we come back from these messages. Don't go away. All right, we are back looking at the Elvis special 1977, and we're going to dive right back in. The lights stayed off at the end of the song for a few seconds longer than usual. From our table in the center of the showroom, we could detect something large and white moving across the stage. The lights came on again to reveal a bed. The audience, already in a state of disarray, went wild. <laughs> Elvis fell flat onto the bed and commenced singing What Now My Love. Yeah. He this is decades before Madonna sang on a bed. <laughs> he turned to onto his a, side. A decade, I should say. He turned onto his side and thumped the pillow, saying in a high squeaky voice, Where's she going? Where's she going? <laughs> Halfway through the song, <laughs> Elvis got off the bed and we applauded as it was rolled off stage. <laughs> Elvis continued the song in a remarkably controlled voice. The audience, however, couldn't stop laughing, and for those of us who <laughs> witnessed that amazing scene, Elvis had ruined forever the seriousness of what now I love. <laughs> We'd ever more giggle on hearing that song. Oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> uh, the, the suspicious... <laughs> The suspicious mind's introduction began, but Elvis started to sing Bridge Over Troubled Water, yeah. fighting it out with the orchestra, but giving up after a couple of verses. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold the show. Just drop everything. Everybody fall out. Charlie Hodge dramatically fell over. Elvis walked over him to say, bless you, son. He apologized to us. I don't really like to do that, but I got to stick to one song or the other. Let's do Bridge Over Troubled Water. He fooled around with the lyrics at the start of the tune. Someone called out to interrupt him. Shut up, intoned Elvis in a deep voice. And the audience's laughter and the smattering of applause at this made Elvis forget the words of the song. He stopped singing and the band took over. They stood up and sang in unison and the audience joined in as Elvis stood listening. Oh, that's nice. Listen, listen, listen. The Ted Mack Amateur Hour. Very nice. Thank you very much, said Elvis. The band sat down and Elvis finished the song, giving it a powerful rendition. Afterwards, he thanked the band for helping out. A good version of Suspicious Minds followed, with a few ad-libs thrown in. And then Elvis began his introduction. He paused as Charlie began to pick up the sheet music he'd kicked over earlier. <laughs> Charlie, you don't have to do that. Get someone to come out of here. So get, get somebody uh, backstage to come out and pick the sheet music up. Joe, Red, Sonny, Lamar? Sonny West and Red, Red West appeared and picked up the sheet music. Elvis, satisfied, got on with the introdu introductions. Okay, over on the left is Mr. J.D. Sumner and the Stamps, Stamps Quartet. The young ladies up front are the Sweet Inspirations, uh, the, or the Sweet Something or Other, the Sweet Inspirations. <laughs> the little girl who does our high voice singing is uh, Kathy Westmoreland. On lead guitar, he said in a deep voice, is James Burton. <laughs> On the rhythm guitar is John Wilkinson. He emphasized the name, having got it wrong so many times before. Yeah. In a deep draw, he said, and on the drums is Ronnie Tut. So the introductions continued till Elvis came to Joe Gershow. Put the light back on Joe, please. 
Would you look at that belt? Stand up, Joe, please. It's fantastic. <laughs> the usual personalities were in the audience, including actor George Hamilton, Colonel Parker, and singer Bobby Gentry. Elvis enthused over her. She's opening at the frontier. Go see her act. She's a wow. He introduced his dad, who came on stage, arms raised to great cheers. Elvis walked to the front of the stage and to the corner seat between the ramp and the stage and <laughs> leant down. I want, to, I want you to say hello to Linda. She's a friend. Hello, dear. And he raised Linda Thompson's arm. The audience applauded, albeit politely, obviously realizing who Linda was. <laughs> I'd like to sing a song that I hope you like. A fan yelled out, hey, wait a minute now. I'm running this show. <laughs> oh, a fan yelled out, hey, wait a minute now. I'm running this show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd like to sing a song that was done by, uh, what's his name? Elvis couldn't bring Richard Harris's name to mind. It's a song called My Boy. So beautifully did Elvis sing this song, it was a joy to listen to him. It's a good song, he told us. I've saved Charlie Hodge till last because he's the least. No, because he does this fantastic harmony with me. He's been doing it for 13 years, and he does it so well that it's almost like one voice. And Elvis paid tribute to a somewhat overlooked group member. Elvis's uh, next song was I Can't Stop Loving You, ending with his usual incredible voice-bending notes. At the start of American tri Trilogy, he sang, Look away, Disneyland, and urged the stamps to sing it, fellas. Sing it now. Do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he emphasized the word Disneyland in their solo <laughs> verse of the song. Yeah. <laughs> Elvis sang the remainder uh, uh, completely seriously, a marvelous rendition of one of the finest tunes he's ever sung on stage. Oh, what a wonderful moment it was when the flute solo had been played and the music began to build. The look on Elvis's face was one of total involvement. The applause reflected the audience's appreciation. Having created a muse mood of musical perfection, the king launched into a big hunk of love, a foot-stomping tune that took us back to his early rocking days. He took time to tell us afterwards, I'd like to say something about the song we did before, American Trilogy. The guy that plays the flute solo, Jimmy Mullador, he's played it 144 times and never missed a note. Thank you. Stand up, Jimmy. The trumpet players, they've actually split their lips blowing so hard, really. <laughs> we kid a lot, and we have a lot of fun, but we really love to sing and play music and entertain people. That's the name of the game. As the applause died down, Elvis said, uh, I'd like to uh, do a song that's one of my favorites, and I hope you like it. His version of The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face was tenderly and beautifully interpreted, so much better than his recorded version. But then most of his live songs are... Mm -hmm. This chain that I've got around my neck, he indicated the heavy gold chain, was given to me last night by the hotel, the Hilton Hotel. It has my initials here, and it's just a favor for doing a third show last night. He hesitated for a moment, and his face became serious. There's a guy here that works in the Italian restaurant. His name's Mario. A smattering of applause. And the people are getting ready to fire him as soon as I leave. And I don't want him to go, because he needs a job, and I think the Hilton's bigger than that. We applauded, a little surprised at Elvis's words. No disrespect, he concluded, but just wake up Conrad and tell him about Mario's job, that's all. <laughs> he then began Mystery Train, singing it very forcefully. Then, as the tune changed to Tiger Man, Elvis interrupted his musicians to say, this next song's dedicated to the hierarchy and the staff of the Hilton Hotel. Yeah. And the king of Vegas, uh, <laughs> of the Vegas jungle sang Tiger Man yep. fiercely. How Great Thou Art is the finest song I've heard Elvis do live, and this was his next selection. Elvis put so much power and sincerity into his singing that the whole showroom vibrated, and you thought the balcony must surely come falling down. This is one song that Elvis never fools around on. As Elvis ended on his high note, he flung back his arm, and a shower of sweat from his face was beaded in the spotlight. Do it again? He asked. Yeah. We yeah, we encouraged. And then uh, he repeated the, the end of the song. Do it again? I don't care. I'll sing it all night. <laughs> he repeated the final verse again, so obviously enjoying himself. You're very nice, he thanked us. To our surprise, he began softly singing, Help Me Make It Through the Night. Afterwards, asking Charlie to bring his chair on stage, Elvis sat down on the blue chair and tilted his head backward, a look of exhaustion for a moment on his face. I'd like to tell you a little story. His voice was quiet and intensely serious. No one knew what he was going to say. We sat still, expectantly. 
<laughs> no, I'm just kidding around. <laughs> okay. Tell you what, here, we're going to leave you all in suspense on what happens next at this Elvis concert. And this is really cool. It's really neat hearing about this. We're going to tell you more about that when we come back from these messages. All right, we have been enjoying a really cool story uh, from somebody who was there on the Elvis special 1977. All right, I'm going to go back and uh, take it away, John. All right, so as uh, when we left, I was Elvis was about to tell us a little story. I bet you guys can guess what this story is. Uh, he said, uh, there was a man in Florida, and he was dying of cancer, and he was in a coma. He'd been in a coma for three days, and his wife was sitting up by his side. And on the third morning, as she lay down beside him and dozed off to sleep... And he felt her as she dozed off to sleep, and at the same time, he felt himself starting to die. The audience was gazing, hypnotized, awestruck, <laughs> in silence at the lone figure seated in the spotlight. It was as though a spell had been cast upon us. Elvis continued, and he took his notepad from, pe uh, and he took his notepad from beside the bed, and he wrote, softly, softly. as I leave you. <laughs> Long before your arms can beg me stay. Long before your arms for one more hour can beg me stay for one more day. For oh, one more. Day. Anyway, sorry. You don't the want orchestra to get struck. had picked up on the song and were playing almost imperceptibly behind Elvis as he spoke the poignant words of the true story. After all the years, I can't bear the tears to fall. So softly, softly, I will leave you there. <laughs> His voice had become almost a whisper. That's all. Take it home, he told the musicians, barely waiting for our applause. It took a few moments for us to come out of the spell he'd cast, and then the whole audience stood up as he sang Can't Help Falling in Love. He was distributing white scarves as on a conveyor belt, fed by Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> At the song's conclusion, he came forward on the ramp. The audience was cheering. Lamar Fike appeared, and Elvis jumped onto his broad back and rode away off stage. <laughs> then came back on his own two feet to the delight of the still wildly applauding crowd. <laughs> the gold curtain went back up and Elvis came down the ramp again, giving out scarves and shaking hands. At length, he turned and ran off stage, his hand rippling inside of the blue curtain, and he was gone. The mind-blown audience was left to go its separate ways, having been fortunate enough to witness a superlative and inspired performance by Elvis, <laughs> the world's greatest showman. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's... And I tell you, she must have had a tape of the show. Yeah. Because those are almost direct quotes from oh, the bits that we've heard. Absolutely. You know, and uh, that's just... Oh, that's cool. What's... Um, uh, we which could, one? Well, since we're already at 34, we could do King Elvis's Mines. Yeah, that's a... Which is toward the back. This toward, is an interesting... Uh, one of the, the an interesting flight of imagination from one of the fans right yeah so this is uh they they get incredibly specific about the beginning um <laughs> in some ways specific in some ways not specific enough yeah yeah <laughs> so okay all right i will uh yeah yeah, I'm debating if I want to read this in William Shatner's voice, but I don't think I can keep it up for the whole time. Uh, <clears throat> we'll let it come and go as it feels natural. <laughs> <laughs> the time is the 25th century. No. The place is outer space. The destination, the destination, Earth. That barren planet, devoid of life since the 22nd century, when man destroyed his world. Our quest, to seek out the legendary treasures of one Elvis Presley. The legend goes that one 20th century entertainer, a certain Elvis Presley, had amassed a collection of gold, platinum, and silver discs in a mansion in Memphis, a collection unequaled in the world and a treasure beyond belief. Our ship's mission was to seek out the treasure and return it to the Elvinor. <laughs> Man. That's We're the uh, 2825 EAP Society. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Where would be? Where it would be? put on display in the Planet's Museum of Past Culture for future generations of Elvins to view and marvel at. That sounds more like Jim Carrey's version of Shatner. Uh, the, um, ho however, we were not the only planet interested in the treasure. For planet Osmonda and its inhabitants, the Donnies, oh my God, were also <laughs> seeking out King Elvis's mines. Their aim was to locate the disks and melt them down to make effigies of their planet's founders, the Osmonds a family who had been exiled from Earth in the 20th century for their interpretation of an art known as popular music. 
Wow. <laughs> Sense of humor, this one. Yeah, exactly. I dig, I dig that. Earth was now looming large in our interplanetary scanner, so touchdown would be within the hour. With our spaceship had touched, when our spaceship had touched down, our team, two men, a girl, and myself, alight, uh, alighted from the craft to view Earth for the first time. Um, the planet was we found was devoid of life in any form, man, beast, or plant. The landscape was barren, covered with an ominous gray dust. Our first job was to find out where we were. We knew that we were somewhere in the continent that was once North America, but our exact location was unknown to us. After a day of exploration, we came across the remains of a huge statue. From the pieces that we found and from the records we had on board our ship, we concluded that the remains were that of the Statue of Liberty. Referring to old maps and atlases from Earth and books on America, we discovered that we had landed on what had once been New York. Using our maps for bearing, we set our transportation watches for Memphis, and in scant seconds we were standing in a spot not much different in outlook from the one we had just left. The difference was an important one for the spaceship, which there what was a for a spaceship was there, which belonged to the Donnies. So I hear Donnie, I think Donatello. Uh, <laughs> we approached the craft only to find it empty. The Donnies had beaten us to Memphis and were already off in search of the King Elvis's mines. A truly chilling thought. Right? They had left a trail that was easily followed and we soon found ourselves at the top of a recently excavated shaft. Cautiously, we enter the dark passage, passage expecting to be set upon by the Donnies at any minute. After what seemed like an eternity, we came across an opening and found to our horror that the Donnies were laying there dead, all except one who told us with his dying breath to beware of the beasts. We hadn't seen a living thing, so we had no idea what these beasts were that he spoke of. We continued along the passageway and came across two marble pillars and two large lions made of a similar marble at their bases. This was the entrance to King Elvis's mansion. We were almost there. As we were about to enter the door which lay beyond the pillars, two marble lions suddenly sprang to life and pounced upon our lead men. Before we could come to their aid, they were dead, torn to shreds by claws of marble. The lions turned from the dead men and were about to pounce upon pounce upon Elvira and myself when we unbuttoned our gun belts and drew out our ray guns. We disintegrated them with ease and after making sure that no other beasts were lurking, we entered the mansion and proceeded to where the treasure was stored. Upon entering a room known as Elvis's Den, we were confronted by an array of awards that were beyond our wildest dreams. There were discs made of gold, silver, and platinum lining the walls. On shelves and pedestals, there were Emmys, Grammys, and even Oscars, as well as scrolls and various awards from admirers of the great King Elvis. As there were only two of us left alive, it took us quite a while to transport all of the, all of the treasures back to our spaceship, even with the help of our transportation watches. Once we had completed the task and buried the dead, we buttoned down our hatches and blasted off Destination Elvenor. We had completed our mission at the cost of lives, but the treasures of King Elvis's mines were now safely on their way to a place where they could be marveled at for many centuries to come. <laughs> I love that uh, this is like Elvis sci-fi fan fiction. Yeah. That is a, a new twist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a new one. That's why I thought it would be kind of fun. <laughs> Just something different, right? Okay, well, uh, we are going to take a short break uh, and uh, as we make our way back from Elvenor. And uh, we've got uh, one more thing to look at when we... Oh, there we go. we got one more thing to look at when we come back from these messages. All right, we are back and looking at the Elvis special 1977. And uh, John's got one more really cool of the moment article for you. And uh, take it away, John. Yeah, this is uh, an account from September of 1974. This is called Such a Night, Thoughts from Pat Bars. It was a night. Oh, what a night it was. It really was such a night. How true those words are. For the 1st of September really was such a night. 1st of September, 1974. The Las Vegas Hilton Dinner Show, having experienced nine fantastic shows last year and already having seen a few precious shows this visit, receiving a quick kiss on the previous night's dinner show, I th thought I'd seen it all. But no, the following dinner show was a night I'll never forget as long as I live. <laughs> to start off the evening, I was put into a seat near, up, near the front but not near enough. Anyone who has sat ringside will know that once having been lucky enough to be that close, you really cannot be satisfied with the second best. So I had tipped fairly high for this dinner show, been given a front table, only to be seated at the far end of the table. 
I knew that I had to be near that stage to fully accomplish all I had in mind for that night with a carrier bag of goodies for Elvis, safely secured under the table. I knew this placing was hopeless for reaching him, mind you, as I was prepared to climb on the table as I had the previous night. But what's this? The bell captain, who had taken my tip earlier, having promised me a better seat, came back, whispered to follow, Am I eager and up and go... Uh, oh, Am I eager and up and go without paying the check for the meal, which my friends later found out had been paid for by a rich Texan? I'd like to thank him, whoever he is. So my longings have been fulfilled. I suddenly find myself in one of the best seats of the house, the stage seat, second table from the ramp. I'm sitting trembling, wondering how I shall ever get these presents to Elvis, hoping I'll succeed in all I want to do. I cannot believe my luck. I've sat ringside before, but never so close to where Elvis stands continually. And so I sit, and if only Elvis could have seen my knees knocking, I was in a state, not exactly afraid, for who could be afraid of Elvis? It was the thoughts racing through my mind of how I would reach him with these gifts. And so my fever rises as 2001 begins and Elvis walks on stage in the most magnificent jumpsuit imaginable. A beautiful, a beautiful pure white suit with a complete tiger on it. I gasped at the very sight of him. He was a sheer beauty. I was lost in the magic of him, but I knew that I had about an hour at the most to achieve my goal. And so he sings, as always, the master, thrilling and moving with words, exciting with his movements. And suddenly I know I have to give him all these, these two books, all fancy gift wrapped. As he comes near, I hold them out to him. He's seen them. He couldn't fail to. I'm within inches of him. He's singing and he comes over. He's so close. His white scarf is so tempting. Within a flash, I am the proud owner of that very scarf. <laughs> it is snugly around my neck. But still, I haven't given him the books. Still, I stand there and hold them. But for a quite uh, a while, he is telling some lady about his swollen hand. She is right next to me. Surely he'll take the books. He knows I'm watching his every movement. Because when he looks at me, he can see the way I'm watching him. <laughs> I'm numb now. I'm paralyzed. And he's suddenly talking and he moves to me. And I suddenly give him the books. He's minus a scarf, as I got the last one. He holds the books to Charlie, puts on another white scarf, and I'm still standing. I want a kiss from him. He walks towards me again, and suddenly it's like a dream. I see the two pools of two blue pools of eyes coming toward me. I see the soft skin, the black hair, the perfect mouth, and he can see that I'm waiting. And he pops his eyes out to say, Don't rush, kid. You'll get it soon enough. <laughs> then suddenly I felt the kiss. It still lingers now. The soft warmth of his mouth. And again, oh. this is like uh, romantic fan fiction. It is. Uh, except it was apparently true. Yeah. Ro romantic uh, fan truth and whatever. <laughs> Uh, and again, I get the scarf he's wearing. I now sit dumbfounded with two scarves around my neck and a kiss and still lingering. I've always wondered what it would be like to know when those movie stars kissed him. Now I know. Pat, seems like you had a good time. Surely I'd uh, been given all that I was entitled to. Ah, but I still had some beautiful red felt hearts to throw him. Dare I take the liberty of getting his attention again? I wasted my time until Elvis stood in line with me, his legs apart, and I threw them around his feet. He stood, looked, and laughed. I think he thought I came armed with a tank load of goodies. <laughs> what did he do then? He went to Charlie, got another white scarf, and came to me and threw it to me. I couldn't believe my luck. I never did make the midnight show. I was too overcome. I had all I could dream of, and I was exhausted. I laid my three precious scarves out on my bed, and I thank God I was so lucky. But three scarves wasn't all. The last midnight show, I sat, luckily, at the foot of the ramp, cost $100 to get there, and Elvis came down there a lot that night to talk with uh, Pris, Pris and Lisa, and I gave him a gift, uh, a gift wrapped up. I don't think he'd forgotten me from the previous night. When I put the gift on stage, I pushed it along. He picked it up and looked at me and said, Thank you. I had put a card with God bless on it, and he looked at it and then smiled and then gave the expression of the parcel exploding on him. <laughs> he handed me another scarf that night, which I almost lost when someone tried to grab it. No one on earth can take what these memories from me, but somehow... I think the best is yet to come. Clink, clink. My money falls into my savings box once more. 
saving again for a night to remember, maybe in Vegas or more likely in Memphis, where my next holiday will be. But until the August night in 1976, when my savings have taken me over there, I'll think on Sunday, September 1st, 1974, and such a night. That's fantastic. So there you get a stage side fan's account of what it was like waiting to give Elvis something. That's cool. <laughs> that's a great That's a great story. I absolutely love that. Yeah. That's really, 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 really neat. Never knew... Uh, just uh, how much imagination the female fans that got a kiss put into it. That's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I probably have more of an idea than most, but... <laughs> yeah. You walked in the... I've walked you never in the, stood in that man's I, I, shoes. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, yeah. I've walked around in them loafers for... I've walked a block in those socks every now and again. Um, but, um, yeah, the such a neat book. And, as you, all, you know, this one is especially packed with, like people who were there stories from folks who were there which is really really yeah. really cool and uh yeah so just something really unique and different elvis special 1977 and because it came out because it was put together uh, around june of 76 things are still going people are still you know enjoying themselves and everything else and uh so some really neat stories uh yeah, obviously, seeing the 78 issue will be uh, interesting. And yeah, and then 79 will be the first one after that was made after he's gone. Yeah, it'll be interesting to yeah. see how they covered all of that. Yeah, but no. Yeah, but ah, it's so great to have these books. And of course, you know, really nice historical tomes as we've looked at things like Dave and Paul. Uh, David and Paul have put out, um, but you know these from the time at the time is just incredibly special, and it's so nice to have them. I'm so glad they did these. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So, anyway, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, did you have this? Do you have this? Uh, let us know in the comments what your favorite moments are. If you still remember some of those, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Anyway, I am Jamie. And I'm John. And this is the Elvis Archival Preservation Society. The whole point of the EAP Society is to make sure that Elvis history is not lost to history and that the perspectives and the stories and information about releases and, and products and everything else from when Elvis was alive all the way up till today are uh, preserved for uh, current generations and future generations, no matter what your budget is because Elvis liked for his art to be available to people of all walks and we like to pay that forward as best we can. Uh, the EAP Society, of course, being uh, interested in Elvis history, this is not just a YouTube channel. This is a people-powered movement. That means you. Like, share, comment, and subscribe. Uh, like, share, comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you are not already because when we hit 20,000 subscribers, we are going to give away this bad boy. This is an actually owned, personal item owned by Elvis Presley this from 1956 he owned this until 1973 so for quite a few years and when we get to 20,000 subscribers somebody is going to win this and that's going to be really really cool so the more folks you can send the faster we get to 20,000 the uh, quicker we will be giving that away and in the meantime we will enjoy it on the set and we can all enjoy it together. So anyway, uh, we do uh, live events in the to further the goals of the EAP Society. So check out the bar below. You see we have an event in Iowa, but also we want to expand and do other things as well as a way to uh, give folks an Elvis-filled weekend that's not going to break their bank. And of course, the proceeds that come in from that uh, help the endeavors and the goals of the EIP Society and help us do more things and preserve more things. And we want to be even more active, and that's in the preservation of those things uh, and uh, helping the fan community and growing the fan community in any way that we can. And all of that does help with that. We thank everybody for their support there. If you want to get in on the ground floor of the EAP Society, you can become a member. Go to EAPsociety.com and click on Become a Member. And uh, paid tier members get all of the cool perks that you see at the bottom of the screen. The more members we have, the more stuff we can do because that's the way everything works. Uh, the, more, uh, the more people power and more economic power we have, the more things we can do both for our members and for the Elvis community at large. So we thank you so much. Our members make so much of this possible. We love you all. Thank you very much, especially to our very own Colonel, Colonel Miles Foreman. Thank you, Colonel. All right, we uh, put out uh, Tuesday. We have Quick Take Tuesday, and of course our main channel content on Friday. So until the next video, be good to yourselves. Be good to each other. And always, TCB. TCB. My society. 
Society, yeah, that's for me. Oh, my society. 